Are we there? Revelation chapter 1, the Bible says, beginning in verse number 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Why, my friends? What is, not, what is that next phrase? Why? For the time is at hand. I want to turn your attention right now to this article from Christianity Today, which says in the headline, Preach apocalyptic texts. When? Now, says those in Babylon. It's time to make this tricky, they call it tricky, biblical genre, a mainstay in your sermon rotation. Several years ago, he said, I gathered a small group of dear saints together to discuss a short sermon series I was preparing on what two chapters of Revelation? Revelation 12 and 13. And that's what we covered somewhat yesterday during our midday power surge. It says, these chapters are not for the faint of heart. They recount the Apostle John's apocalyptic vision of the great dragon, Satan, seeking to devour the Messiah as a baby. Look at this last point now. I asked the group, in what ways are these chapters of Revelation 12 and 13 relevant to us? One person looked me straight in the eye and said what? And said none. I wonder what professed SDA would say today. What would we say today? And throughout this, I was going to say midday power surge. Throughout this Bible study, this Sabbath message, bread from heaven's bakery, I want everyone to note this. God's people, the remnant people of God, must expect war in these last days. Expect what, friends? And what says Revelation 12 and verse 17? The dragon was wroth with the woman. And when to make what? War. With the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us this war is going to begin in these last days. It's going to continue until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look at Daniel chapter 7 to confirm. Hold your place. Where are we going to, my friends? Daniel chapter 7. And look what the Bible says in verse 19 of Daniel chapter 7. What you shall see right here is this vision. God showed to Daniel. Look carefully, my friends. These four kingdoms of prophecy. The lion, Babylon. The beer, Medes of Persia. Then we have the leopard. That's Greece. Then the dreadful and terrible, which is pagan Rome. And in Daniel chapter 7, the Bible tells us that Daniel wanted to focus simply on pagan Rome. And then on the papacy. Look at Daniel 7 with me. And the Bible says in verse 19, Then I would know the truth of which beast? The fourth beast. That's pagan Rome, right? And verse number 20, and of that little horn. And verse 21 says, I beheld, and the same little horn made war with the saints. But that little horn will grow how? Will grow stout and look more stout than his fellows. Verse 21, I beheld the stout horn made what, friends? War with the saints. How long? Verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints. And the saints possessed the kingdom. And it goes on, friends. So the remnant must expect this spiritual war from the papacy until when? Until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, friends, am I ready for this? Are you ready for this? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. What season are we in? You know, friends, there are four seasons because of sin in the world. 
yearly, four seasons. What are they, my friends? Spring, then summer, then autumn, fall, and then comes winter. And what season are we now in? Winter season. Spiritually, what season are we in? A season of war, Ecclesiastes. The Bible tells us, my friends, hold your place in the book of Revelation. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Are we there? Look at chapter 3 with me. The Bible tells us in chapter 3 and verse 1, to everything there is a what? A season. And a time to every purpose under the what? The heaven. Look at verse 8. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and what, friends? A time of peace. What season are we now in? I'm going to prove by God's grace we are in the season of war. Revelation chapter 12. Go back there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? This is an urgent message. Revelation chapter 12. Look with me at verse number 17. And what says verse 17, my friends? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make what? War with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, friends. Who is the dragon in the primary sense? The dragon represents Satan. Put it down. The dragon represents Satan in the primary sense. And that is... Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Who does the woman represent in verse 17? This is the pure church, God's true believers. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Verse 25, the woman represents the church. Now notice, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, there are four battles. How many, my friends? And the first battle began in heaven. Put that down. The first battle, the location, is in heaven. That's Revelation 12, verse 7 through verse 9. First battle. The second battle, watch now, the second battle is in Revelation 12, verse 1 through verse 5. Revelation 12, verse 1 through verse 5. Second battle, time period. Second battle, first advent. You see the dragon trying to destroy the woman and her child. Time period, first advent. Location, Jerusalem, Judea. Location, Israel. Location, Middle East. Location, Asia. This is a second battle of Revelation 12. Third battle. Third battle, Revelation chapter 12. Verse 6. Put it down. Verse 6. Verse 13 through 15. Verse 6, 13 through 15. This is a third battle of Revelation chapter 12. What time period? 1260 days, meaning 1260 years, which began when? 538 and came to an end when? 1798. Time period? 538 through 1798. Who reigned and persecuted God's people, the church? 538 through 1798, 1260. This is the papacy. So, what is the location? Of that third battle, where is the Vatican situated? In Europe, my friends. Primarily Europe, of course, also in Africa. Put down the Eastern Hemisphere. Third battle, the Eastern Hemisphere. Europe primarily, Africa. The third battle, skip on down now to the fourth and final battle of Revelation chapter 12. It's verse 16 and verse 17. The Bible tells us, are we there? And the earth helped the woman. Do you see it, my friends? So verse 13 to verse 15, you see the papacy persecuting God's people up until 1798. To which nation 
did the, did the refugees find refuge? The pilgrims, the Puritans, they fled to where? They fled to America. So what is the earth in chapter 12 and verse 16 of Revelation? It is the United States of America, verse 16, and the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth, underscore mouth, and swallowed up the flood, flood peoples, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. What scripture says the earth represents the United States of America. Revelation 13 and verse number 11. By the way, you can connect verse 10 and verse 11 to that. The papacy receiving her deadly wound, going into captivity. That's verse 10 of chapter 13. Then verse 11 shows us, and I saw another beast ascending, coming up out of the earth. Having what? Two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon, my friends. The United States of America. Now, friends, question. How does America speak? Her mouth. She speaks to her laws. Legislative, that's Congress. Judicial, the United Supreme Court. Does that make sense, my friends? So that means laws were pushed forth from America, the earth, that gave the woman a place of refuge. What were those laws? Where can we find them today? In the United States Constitution. What do those two horns represent? Religious freedom and civil freedom. But what says verse 11 of Revelation 13? She will speak as a what? A dragon. And when America speaks, what will she say? Go to verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. So what must the remnant expect beginning in America? War, my friends. Does it make sense? And what says Revelation 12 and verse 17? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war. Went where? Wherever the woman, the woman found refuge. That was in America. So where will the war begin, my friends? Now hear me. You have many individuals. When they hear what President Trump is now promoting on the point of religious freedom, what the religious conservatives in America are now touting, which is religious freedom, many are saying this prophecy will never come to pass. America will never persecute anybody. And others are saying, even if so, this should come to pass. It is far off in the future. Look at this right here, my friends. Let's pass that. Notice what this says. What did Mr. Trump promote at the National Prayer Breakfast just a few moments ago? Red words. In everything we do, we are creating a what? A culture that protects what, friends? Freedom. And that includes religious freedom. Take a listen. In America, we don't punish prayer. We don't tear down crosses. We don't ban symbols of faith. We don't muzzle preachers. We don't muzzle pastors. In America, we celebrate faith. We cherish religion. We lift our voices in prayer and we raise our sights to the glory of God. Look with me at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. This sounds as if America will always guarantee religious freedom as long as President Trump is in office. That's how it sounds, right, my friends? But what says Matthew 24? In an hour that you think not, what happens? Then comes the crisis, Matthew 24, verse 3, verse 4, verse 9. When the question was asked of Christ, 
what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The first thing Jesus said was that no man deceive you. And what is in verse 9 of Matthew 24? You shall be hated of what, friends? Of all nations for my sake. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. All nations beginning where? In the United States of America. Pause. So either Christ and the Bible are correct. And what is being promoted in America, religious freedom, is a deception. Or the reverse. Which one will you believe? The Bible, my friends. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. It says, they promise you liberty, but they will bring you into bondage. Let's move on, friends. Take a look one more what Mr. Trump said. Last year at the United Nations, I was honored to be the first president to host a meeting of religious freedom. It was based all on religious freedom. That was the first meeting of its kind ever held at the United Nations. There I called upon all nations to combat the terrible injustice of religious persecution. And people listened. my friends the nations are following the United States of America to promote what they call religious freedom so what will happen when America begins to persecute God's command men keeping people will the other nations also follow go to Psalm 55 with me will they also follow Go to Psalm 55 and while you're going there I want to read Maranatha Page 214, where are we going to, my friends? Psalm 55. We're going to the book Maranatha, and look with me at page 214. America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath and the people of every country. How many countries? of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States of America. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. Then we are told God's faithful people will feel not the oppressive power of Popery alone, but what? Of the Protestant world, the image of the beast. Go to Psalm 55. Where are we going to, my friends? Psalm 55. The Bible tells us, I want everyone to watch this. Psalm 55. Hold your place in the book of Revelation. Psalm 55. I want everyone to watch what this says in verse number 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. But what was in his heart? Ah, friends, can you see the application? One more time, verse 21, the words of his mouth were smoother than butter. Hmm. But war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they were they drawn swords. And remember, the tongue. The tongue. False prophecy. The sword persecution. Black horse, pale horse. You missed that. Verse 22, encouragement. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. And what, friends? He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be what? Moved. Come back here, friends. In that, at that same national prayer breakfast, Mr. Trump made a statement that they have just launched the International Religious Freedom Alliance, the first ever alliance. Listen to what Mike Pompeo said. 
Our mission spans nationalities, political systems, and creeds. Together, we say that freedom of religion or belief is not a Western ideal, but truly the bedrock of societies. Our mission spans nationalities, political systems, and creeds. Together, we say that freedom of religion or belief is not a Western ideal, but truly the bedrock of societies. It sounds as if what they are promoting, international religious freedom, does not pertain to any one creed, right? Any one religion, right? Sounds good. Their words are what? Smooth like what? Oil and butter. But what is in their hearts? War. All right? Listen to what he says next. You can choose any religion or no religion. Sounds good, right? Listen. It's grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Every human being has the right to believe in whatever it is they wish, to change their faith or to hold no faith at all. Indeed, we... It's grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Every human being has the right to believe in whatever it is they wish, to change their faith or to hold no faith at all. Indeed, we... It sounds good, right? And that's why many individuals are saying those who preach a coming mark of the beast, son the law, and persecution for God's commandment-keeping people, God's Sabbath-keeping people, you are mere alarmists. No such thing will happen in America. Look at what our leaders are saying and promoting. Others are saying, even so, it's far off in the future. I want Mr. Trump to win a second term to push back this coming crisis if it's really going to happen. But listen what God says in Ezekiel chapter 12. Ezekiel chapter 12. Where are we going to, my friends? Ezekiel chapter 12. And look with me at verse 22. Son of man, what is that proverb? That you have in the land of Weir, Israel, seeing the days are prolonged and every vision faileth. So what were many saying back there, my friends? Two things. Come on, what were they saying back there? Before Babylon came, Nebuchadnezzar, to pummel Jerusalem. What were they saying? What? The prophecies are what? prolonged far off in the future and what the visions have failed look at verse 22 verse 23 now tell them therefore thus saith the lord god i will make this proverb to what cease and they shall no more use it as a proverb weir in the church in Israel, but say unto them, what friends, urgency, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. Meaning, the days are at hand. It's now. It won't be prolonged. And what else? You say every vision faileth? No. The effect of every vision is coming. Go to verse 25. For I am the Lord. I will speak and the word that I shall speak, and the word I shall speak, shall come to pass. It shall be no more what? Prolonged for in your days. O rebellious house, will I say the word, and what? And will perform it. In whose days, my friends? Your days. I wonder, what is God saying to us now? Go to verse 26 again. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, Did they stop saying it? No. The vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesieth of the times that are what? Far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged anymore. But the words which I have spoken, what, my friends, shall be done. Is that urgency, my friends? 
And one of our problems is that we are walking by sight. Look at what Mr. Trump and Mr. Pompeo, look at what they're saying and promoting. No coming crisis. By the way, Pope Francis is a man of peace. No crisis. We are walking by what? By sight. But what says 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Go there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse 7. What says verse 7 of 2 Corinthians, my friends? It says, for we walk by faith. And what, friends? And not by sight. How can we apply this today? Walk by faith and not by... What is faith, my friends? Hebrews 11 verse 1. What is faith? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The what? The evidence of things not seen applied to our study. Many don't see the evidences of a coming son, the law. So what happens now? They are incredulous. But God's people, it says, now faith is the substance, the coming Christ, the second coming, the substance of things hoped for, even though we don't see what? The evidence is we walk by faith and not by sight. You want darkness? And what is the light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts? For we have a more sure word of prophecy. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 and verse 20. And those who are looking for mere evidences from Mr. Trump, from Robert Jeffries, from Paula White, the evangelicals, Franklin Graham, Paul Francis, they are moving by what? Simple evidences. But we walk by what? Faith. And those who look for evidences and not faith and combine both, they become scoffers. They become what? Go to 2 Peter with me. This is going to be an urgent message for us, friends. Where are we going to? 2 Peter chapter 3, and look with me at verse number 4, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in what days? Last days. Scoffers. Who are these people? Who are they? Scoffers walking after their own lusts. And what are they saying? Let's read now. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Verse 5, for this they willingly are what? Ignorant of. Did they receive signs? <laughs> and the signs they received were found in the preaching of whom? Of Noah. And that's what verse 6 and verse 7 say. The preaching of Noah. Look at what this says. This president, Tony Perkins, this president has not only ceased the war on people of faith. But what says the prophecy? This coming a war on the people of faith. Does it make sense, friends? Does it make sense? Look at this. This is Patriots and Prophets. Page 96, it says, It was not the multitudes or majorities that were on the side of right. So where were the majority? Where were the majority? Thank you. Second sentence, The world was arrayed against God's justice and his laws. And Noah was regarded as a fanatic. Great men, worldly honored, and wise men repeated the same. What were they saying? Listen, the threatenings of God, they said, are for the purpose of simply intimidating and will never be verified. There's no seven last place coming. No mark, no persecution. You need not be alarmed. They said, such an event as the destruction of the world by the God who made it and the punishment of the beings that he has created will never take place. Listen, be at peace, they said, 
Fear not, they said. Noah is a wild fanatic. So what would they call us? What would your family member call you? As you stand upon these principles, what will your unconverted spouse call you? What will your unconverted children who are grown call you? Or parents call you? Brethren who should be brethren. Sisters who should, even your siblings. You are a wild fanatic. Last sentence. The world made merry at the folly of who they called a deluded old man. Next paragraph. The world before the flood. Listen to what they said. The world before the flood reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been what? Fixed. Let that sink in. Heretofore, rain had never fallen. How could Noah be preaching? A flood is coming. It had never rained. The earth had been watered by a mist or dew. They reason as what, friends? As whom? They reason as many reason now. That if the message of Noah were correct, nature would be turned out of her course. I'm going to come back to that. They made that message of Noah in the minds of others a delusion. Noah is deceiving you. It's a grand deception. Then they said, if what Noah was preaching was true, other men would be preaching it. Other worldly renowned men, wise men, would also be preaching it. Let's come back here. This says, how they reasoned before the flood, many are reasoning when? Now, that if there would be a flood, that means nature must be turned out of her course. Many are saying today, if you are preaching that America is going to persecute God's commandment-keeping people, do you know, Pastor Henriquez, what must happen to the U.S. Constitution? Does it make sense now? They're saying that means the U.S. Constitution must be ripped apart, shredded. Its principles must be repudiated. And since that document is the foundation of America, to shred that document would destroy America, destroy the world. Do you see the reason, my friends? So now they say America will never repudiate those principles of its constitution, civil freedom and religious freedom. Therefore, there can be no persecution for God's commandment-keeping people. Pastor Henriquez is a wild fanatic, they say. They are saying. Does it make sense, friends? By the way, I'm going to go somewhere with that. By the way, in the days of Noah, God gave them a staunch message. Do you know he, gave, he gives us more mercy? Noah was preaching, a flood is coming. Had it ever rained? No. But they were to believe the word by faith. Does it make sense? Does it make sense, my friends? Now watch the point. Today, we are preaching church and state will unite to persecute God's commandment-keeping people. Have we ever seen evidences of that in history? So that means we today should be more faithful to God than those who live when? In the days of Noah, my friends. What now? We have evidences, more or a plethora of evidences. They're saying if America is going to persecute God's commandment keeping people, then pastor, do you not know then the principles of the U.S. Constitution must be shredded? Well, what did Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, do this past week? At Trump's State of the Union address. Now, she did not rip the principles of the U.S. Constitution, per se, literally speaking. But she tore apart Mr. Trump's State of the Union speech. And my mind went to this. One day, very, very soon, 
they are going to repudiate, tear apart, rip apart, shred the principles of freedom in the U.S. Constitution based on Bible prophecy. I told my family that. I told Hillary that. And do you know, friends, yesterday, Nancy Pelosi's daughter went on an interview and said, one of the reasons why her mother, Nancy Pelosi, ripped apart Trump's State of the Union address was because she believed, Nancy Pelosi, that Mr. Trump had treaded the Constitution. The daughter of Miss Pelosi merged both. I said, Hillary, look at this. Just as I said it, God confirmed it. And then she says, this is Christine Pelosi, the daughter of Nancy Pelosi. She says, when her mother tore Mr. Trump's speech, she was doing it based on Italian influence. Where's the Vatican? Rome, Italy. Ha. And what religion is Nancy Pelosi affiliated with? Roman Catholicism. Hold on, watch now. Come to the screen. Here it is, my friends. At the State of the Union address, Trump affirms religious liberty in the State of the Union. Of course, listen now, friends. This is uh, Mr. Trump speaking. Pelosi did. Look what she did. Notice, this is Fox News. It's, this was yesterday. Christine Pelosi says, Mother Shredding, a State of the Union speech was, quote, an Italian grandma move. Nancy Pelosi was born into an Italian family. All right, notice now. Take a listen. Um, when it was over, she simply took about three seconds to uh, very silently do um, with the speech what she thought it was necessary to do after he had torn up the Constitution and shredded the truth. She decided to tear up the speech. And you said it's in keeping with her uh, Italian grandmother status. Well, yes, <laughs> as I told you before when I came. What a connection, friends. Come on. What a connection here. And notice, watch carefully. Now, this came to my mind. Which entity, which church would love not just to rip apart the actual documents of the U.S. Constitution, not only literally, but in principle, to rip apart the principles of the U.S. Constitution? It is the Vatican. Great controversy. Page 564 says what? The papacy regards... The principles of the U.S. Constitution as a most pestilential error, a pest of all others, most to be dreaded. We can say shredded. Most to be dreaded in a state. And of course, of course, and those who maintain those principles should be anathematized. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church did to God's Ten Commandments. By the way, they rip out, expunged the Second Commandment. And no, they have nine. And then take the ten, God's ten, and what? No, no, they shredded number two, expunged it. And what now? Rip apart, divide God's tenth commandment into two to make the whole number of ten commandments. And if they would have the boldness to do that to God's Ten Commandments, how much more constitution principles of a nation when he has trampled upon the constitution of we of heaven? He also promotes religious freedom. That's what, oh, oh, oh. And in the same breath, the Pope says, Religious freedom? 
Oh, religious freedom. Psalm 55 tells us in verse 21, verse 22, their words are smooth like butter, smooth like oil. But what is in their hearts? War. Their words are like swords. Be not deceived, Jesus says. Does it make sense? It's a war coming, my friends. And now notice, we are told in great controversy, page 587. Because some of us still don't believe the war is right upon us. This is an urgent appeal for us today, safe to serve online, those of you here locally. First time viewers, a Sunday law will be enforced to combat immorality. That's why we are told in Great Controversy, page 587, the fast spreading corruption, they will say, is largely attributable to what? The desecration of the so-called Christian Sabbath and that the enforcement of Sunday observance would do what? Would greatly improve the morals of society. Now, for years, we have seen a movement like this. Let me give you one very recent movement. Look at Judge, or Judge Roy Moore. Headline, February 7, 2020. The Washington Times candidate for Senate, Senator Roy Moore, says what? Bring back the Ten Commandments. Red words, won't spend much time here. Red words, one of the most important issues, says Roy Moore from Alabama, affecting our country is a what? A lack of morality. Then he says, my friends, today, more than ever, we need to return to those laws, Ten Commandments, and moral standards upon which what? Our country was what? Listen to this. He goes on. He says, while the interviewer questioned Roy Moore on a wide range of policy areas, Roy Moore's answers repeatedly pointed back to the nation's moral problem. And the answer to the nation's moral problem, he said, is having the country and its schools do what? Turn back to God to solve morality. Turn back to God how? Hold on. Turn back to God how? On what day, my friends? On what day? On Sunday. Is there a war coming? Let me show you something. When I got to this statement in the Roy Moore article, it says here, blue words, well, well, one thing they should do, America, is teach the laws of God in our schools. Nation schools, first sentence, nation schools. I want to ask a question. How could this be religious freedom for all religions? Who are you going to hire in public schools to teach the Ten Commandments? Can you hire a Sikh to do this? A Muslim? <laughs> a professed atheist? Hold on. So you see that what they're saying does not measure up to, to reality. Hold on. What if the schools and the nation are in a crisis and they say, turn back to God so God can bless us? Turn back to God to what? The Ten Commandments. Do Muslims and Sikhs and who else? Profess atheists and the Jain religion anymore? Buddhist, Hindu, do they honor Ten Commandments? From the Bible, no. So what will happen? They'll begin to say, you're either with us or against us. Fall in line or be persecuted. And which group was Satan? Focus his ire upon, upon God's commandment keeping people, the remnant. Look at this now. Great controversy, page 590. Listen to what it says. Blue words. They will lament the great wickedness in the world. And second, the testimony of religious teachers that the degraded state of morals is caused by what? The desecration of Sunday, great will be the indignation. Great will be what? What's coming for us, my friends? 
Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept their testimony. Write these two quotes down. In Great Controversy, page 588, the chapter entitled Impending Conflict, we are told, every principle of the U.S. Constitution will be repudiated. GC 588. Second quote, volume 5, page 451. Volume 5, page 451, testimonies. It says this, every principle of the U.S. Constitution will be trampled on the foot. Both quotes, similar words, my friends. Now notice, how serious is the war coming? How close are we? Do you know, friends, when the mark of the beast is enforced, we won't be able to what? So who must control the economy in the last days? The papacy. Daniel 11, verse, go there with me. Chapter 11, verse 43 of Daniel. And what are we now seeing, my friends? We are seeing a movement calling for what? The economy of whom? Of Pope Francis. The merchants of the earth. I covered this in Midday Power Surge this week. The merchants of the earth are now united. They have formed a working synergy with the Pope of Rome to enforce what they call the economy of Pope Francis. That's Daniel 11 and verse 43. He will control what? The gold and the silver, the precious treasures of the earth. And people must come to his steps. And this brought back my mind to Matthew chapter 4. What did Satan say to Christ in the third temptation? He showed him the kingdoms and what glory of them and said what? All these things will I give unto you if you fall down and worship me. That means Satan had control over all the precious things of earth because he promised to give it to Christ. Adam gave it to him when he sinned in Genesis chapter 3. Does it make sense? Bring your mind also to Revelation 13, verse 15 through 17. You won't be able to buy or sell except you want. You receive, you worship falsely the economy of Pope Francis. How close are we, my friends? War. Hold on. War. And now we are told, America, her Protestants, Civil leaders are now saying, we are going to be the legs of the Pope's documents, plural. So, be the legs? So who is carrying the Vatican? Who is carrying the woman? Revelation 17, who is carrying the woman? A nation, a beast carrying the woman. America is saying now she will be the legs of the documents of the Pope to put them into action. And then the merchants of the earth are saying we will be the backbone for the Roman Catholic Church's agenda. How much clearer can this be? Is a war ensuing? Look at this now. And then we are told, my friends, oh, I should have put it more clear. February 4th, 2020. In midday power search, this week I covered people shot for what, my friends? Headline, for violating Sunday blue laws. How ominous is the threat? These movements are inimical to our salvation. Shot, my friends. You could go back and, and take a look at that, at that midday power surge. The dragon was what? Wroth with the woman and went to make... You think this thing was a joke, my friends. We always heard of violators of Sunday blue laws being fined, threatened, imprisoned, jailed. But we never read that some were even shot. One was in Virginia. Another was in Pennsylvania. I only gave you the one in Virginia. By the way, it's right there, Pennsylvania. Headline is Pennsylvania, headline Pennsylvania, and below is Virginia, thank, thank God. Both in the one article. Let's write there. And out of the mouth of how many witnesses? 
two or three, let every word be established. Friends, how inimical is this movement to my salvation and yours, our freedom? What must the remnant expect now, my friends? A time of war. But before a time of war, you will hear a time of peace. Then comes a time of war. So what season are we in? Go to Revelation 16. What season are we in? Spiritually, biblically, a season of war. Yet many of God's professed SDA people are apathetic. Incredulous. Have no concern for their salvation. It's eating and drinking and merrymaking, business as usual, a form of godliness while the war is ensuing. Revelation 16, the Bible shows us Satan's three entities of war. How many, my friends? Can I go back to a brief Bible study with you, please? May I, friends? Do I have your permission? Those of you online as well. Go to verse 13. What are Satan's three agencies for, to persecute God's commandment keeping people? Write these three down. The dragon, the beast, and whom? And the false prophet, my friends. That's Revelation 13, 16, 16, verse 13 and verse 14. Look at verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto whom? The kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to what? A picnic, a luncheon, to shake hands, to hug, no, to battle, my friends. Verse 13, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Do you know for years we have preached this Bible study time? Dragon, beast, and false prophet. Who is the dragon in the primary sense? Satan. Satan. Who is the dragon in the secondary sense? The dragon in the secondary sense represents civil leaders. Who? Civil leaders. Two biblical examples. Ezekiel 29, verse 2 and verse 3. Pharaoh. Ezekiel 29, Verse 2 and verse 3. And what did Pharaoh, king of Egypt, do to God's people? Enslave, persecute, restricted, free worship. Does it make sense? What second witness is Herod? In Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 5. Who stood before the woman to destroy her and her man-child before it was born? It was Herod. But Herod was a client king of which power? Rome. So in the secondary sense, the dragon represents the Roman Empire. When we say Roman Empire, pagan Rome. What constitutes an empire? What makes up an empire? Nations. Can you give me, can you give me an umbrella agency that we can call within that agency? It's an empire also. The United Nations, nations, United, comprises of what? Various nations. So in a sense, the dragon power represents today in 2020, the United Nations. Watch this carefully. Look at this, my friends. This is great controversy. Page 438, I won't give you all of this. Blue words, the dragon is said to be Satan. Revelation 12, verse 9. Then it mentions Herod, second phrase. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire in which paganism was what? The prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, what, my friend? A symbol of pagan Rome. That's GC 438. Pagan Rome. But where's pagan Rome now? Shh. That's in the past. So what is a dragon power in these last days now? Look at this. Testimonies to ministers, page 38. It says... Ah, oh, 
It says uh, Satan is full of anger because he cannot bind the people of God into bundles with the world uh, to render to him complete allegiance. Kings, who friends? Kings, rulers, and governors have placed upon themselves the title, the brand of Antichrist. Kings, rulers, governors, linked with whom? Antichrist. And uh, are represented as what? The dragon who goes to make war with the saints, those who keep God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. So who's that dragon power? Kings, rulers, governors are represented as the dragon. That's on the screen right there. So which, which institution embodies the kings of earth, rulers of, of earth, the United Nations, my friends? And they are in league with the Antichrist. By the way, do you recall yesterday I shared an article in Midday Power Search which says the very agenda of the UN is the same agenda of the Vatican? They have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist. They are the dragon power in the last days. Kings, rulers, governors, by the way, which people did Nebuchadnezzar surround himself with in Daniel chapter 3? Kings. Governors, princes, rulers, captains, mayors, dragon power. Clear as day, my friend. Okay, Bible study again. So in Revelation 16, verse 13, verse 14, we see how many powers? Three. How many? What are they? Dragon, beast, false prophet. In Revelation 12, do you see them? Ah, go back there now. This is a powerful chapter. In Revelation 12, do we see all three? I'm going to quiz you now. In verse 1 through verse 5 of Revelation 12, do you see dragon, beast, or false prophet? Who do you see? The dragon power. Verse 1 through verse 5, dragon power. Okay, you passed that quiz. Next quiz. Verse 6, 13 through 15. Which of the two are left? Beast, false prophet. Which power is in verse 6, 13 through 15? Persecuting God's church, the woman, 538 through 1798, 1260 days, 1260 years. Who is it? The beast. Who is the beast? The papacy. All right. Then it's one that's left. Go to verse 16 now. Go to verse 17 of Revelation 12. And the earth in verse 16, the earth opened her mouth. Who do you see now? Who is the earth? Revelation 13 verse 11. It is apostate Protestant America, the false prophet or the image. So all three are also weird. In Revelation what chapter? Revelation chapter 12 Go to Psalm 27 with me, my friends. Is there a war coming? Do you see how powerful the Bible is laid out, my friends? Powerful, my friends. This is present truth for God's people. It's an urgent message. Psalm 27. Where are we going to, my friends? Psalm 27. Look what God's word say. In Psalm 27 and verse 1. Hold your place in Revelation. Psalm 27 and verse number 1. The Bible tells us, The Lord is my what? Light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Is there a war coming? Should we be trepid? Whom shall I fear? Who is Christ looking for? He's looking for gallant Christians. Amen, my friends. I want to be a gallant Christian. Christian in these last days. How about you? No trepidation. It says, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse 2. When the wicked, even my whom, enemies and foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they want. Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. They stumbled and fell. Hold on. Hold on. 
Hold on. What happened to Christ would also happen to us. What happened in Gethsemane when the men led by Judas Iscariot came to capture Jesus? When Christ asked them, whom do you seek? What happened? They fell backwards like dead men. Like dead men. They stumbled and what? Come to verse 3. It says now, what now? Luke 4. What about Luke 4? All right, Luke, Psalm, 20, Psalm 27, look at verse 3. Though an host should encamp against thee, what my friends? My heart shall not fear, though what? The war. Though what friends? The war should rise against me in this. February 8th, 2020, in this will I be what? Confident. Confident. Go to verse 5. It says now, For in the time of trouble, Jesus shall hide me in his pavilion. Oh, Lord, you're too good. No, Lord, you're good. <laughs> verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Pause right there. So where must I, where must you be found? In the time of war, in the season of war, where must we be found just before and in the time of trouble? We are friends. In his pavilion, in the secret place. Where is that? Where is that, my friends? The place of prayer. What scriptures come to mind? Psalm 91. No, the whole division. From verse 1 all the way down. Psalm 91, second scripture. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. Verse 17 and verse 18. Fasting and prayer. So what must be my experience now as I see? We are entering, we are in a season of war. What, my friends, what must be my experience and yours right now? Go to Psalm 55. Where are we going to, friends? Psalm 55. Look at verse 17. Evening, morning, and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. And hath, come on now, and he shall hear my voice. Verse 18. He hath delivered my soul in what? Peace from the battle that was against me. Why? For there were many. With me. Amen. Who will be the many that will be with us? The angels. the angels from glory, my friends. The angels of God encampeth around those that what fear him. And what, my friends, delivereth them. What psalm is that? That Psalm 34 and verse number. Verse number 7, the angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him and deliver at them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And if he's good to us, not if, since he is good to me and you now, Jesus will be good to us then because goodness is a part of his character. The Lord the Lord God, merciful, gracious, no, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Is God good, my friend? Revelation 19. Beloved, as succinct as this lesson is, as convicting as this lesson is, as persuasive as it is, if we aren't careful we will find ourselves in the wrong army. Look at the account of Judas Iscariot. And here is where I'm going now, friends. As we begin to see, we have entered a time of war. The dragon, beast, false prophet are now uniting. Dragon, beast, image of the beast are now forming a working synergy, a confederacy. That means one thing. 
means what? And that one thing is, our investigative judgment is about to close. That's where I'm going to close right now. What is about to close? So everything we have just covered is a clock on the wall. This is where we are. This is that present truth, a part of it. The investigative judgment is about to be over. A verdict is about to be pronounced upon my case, upon your case. Do you want to see it, my friends? Revelation 19. Go there with me. Where are we going to, friends? Revelation 19. You know what? You know, I'm going to skip that verse. Go there. Look at your faces. Revelation what chapter? Chapter 19. Look with me at verse 19. Revelation 19. The Bible tells us in verse 19. Now, tell me if you see the three satanic, barbaric, draconian agencies of Satan. Verse 19. And I saw the beast. Who is the beast? Papacy. Watch now. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the throne and against his army. How many of Satan's three agencies of evil are in verse 19? How many? Which two? The beast and the dragon power. Who is the beast? Papacy. I don't see the word dragon in verse 19 though. Ah, the kings of the earth. Go to, verse 19, go to verse 20 now. Verse 20. And the beast was taken. And with him who now? Ah. And what is their judgment? Where will they be thrown? And the false prophet brings us back. Verse 20 brings us back to Revelation 13. Verse 13 and verse 15. America, the lamb-like beast, the image, works miracles before the, before the first beast, the papacy. The false prophet is the image of the beast of Revelation 13. Pass that. But what is their judgment? Where will they be thrown? In the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That's their judgment. Why am I going here? Wherever you see those three, you see judgment. This is executive judgment, second death. But what about us? Watch this now. Revelation 16. Judgment for them, judgment for us. We must get ready. Revelation 16. Are we there, my friends? It says in verse 13, dragon, beast, false prophet. Verse 14, they are uniting. To war against God. Look at verse 15 now. Behold, I come as a what? There it is. Judgment. Behold, I come as a what? A thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. When you see them going out, to bring the whole world to war against God's people. Behold, Jesus says, I come as a what? A thief. What does that mean? Christ coming as a thief. Does this mean second coming? Does he come as a thief, second coming? So what does it mean he comes as a thief? He comes to our names in the investigative judgment to pronounce a verdict. You are saved or you are lost. How do we know that? Is this our fanciful interpretation? How do we know that? In the book of Revelation, the word thief is used two primary places. Revelation 16. Do you know where else? Revelation 3. Sardis, go there, hold your place. Where are we going to, my friends? Revelation 3. As we read this, let's all examine ourselves. As I bring this to a close, friends. This is the most important thing. We receive urgency. Now it's time for preparation. We receive urgency, prophecy. The war is here. We receive hope. Now it's time to prepare to pass the investigative judgment. Look at verse 2. Are there? What's the first two words? Be watchful 
and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works. How? So how does Christ want to find us? Before we come as a thief, he must find us perfect. Perfect. I don't see the word thief faster. Look at it now. Verse 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and what repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, watch, I will come as a what? Thief. Behold, Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Watch and keep your garments, lest you walk naked. Watch, Revelation 3, verse 3. I watch, I come as a thief. And when he comes as a thief, how must he find me? How must he find you safe to serve online? He must find us perfect. That's investigative judgment. Look at this now. So friends, do you know what my prayer is? Lord, make me perfect. Because I cannot make myself perfect. What are your response to God right now? What is your response to God right now? Make me what? Perfect. Watch. Not only current events. Watch what? Not only Pompeo, Trump, Pelosi. Watch what? Not Roy Moore, the Pope. Watch what? Character. Am I converted? How is my marriage with my spouse? How do I respond to my brethren, my sisters? How do I treat people in general? Watch! What are my habits? Drink, diet, dress, music. What do I listen to? What do I entertain myself with? Watch! Come with me. Verse number four, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled them, their, uh, not defiled their what? Garments, and they shall walk with me, with, how? In white, why? For they are worthy. Hold on, friend, it's rich right here. In Revelation 16, 15, it says what? Behold, I come as a thief, as a thief, Blessed is he that watcheth and what? Keepeth his garment. The same word is in Revelation 3. Keep your garments. That's the connection, friends. Keep your garments. And which church is this? It's Sardis, the one who has a name that they live, but they are spiritually dead. What is God saying to me? What is God saying to you? Lord, am I spiritually dead? While you are about to come as a thief to my name in the records, in the judgment? <laughs> Mr. Trump said, sorry for this. If the House is flipped back to Republicans next election, they can expunge my impeachment. Why do I say that? If we surrender, what will Christ do to my sins and your sins? He is going to blot them out of the record, the books of heaven. However, someone said in the media, however, he will still be an impeached president. But the record of it will be expunged. But not so in Christ's judgment. As far as the east is from the West. So far I have removed your sin. And Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse number 20 says, In that time, saith God, the iniquities of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah shall be sought for, and there shall be none can be found. They are blotted out. Mm -hmm. I want that experience, friends. And Jesus says in Revelation 3, verse 4, 
he is going to pronounce upon us these words, Thou art worthy. What an announcement, friends. Yet who alone is worthy? Only Christ is worthy. But what will he pronounce upon me if I just watch, see my need? What will he pronounce upon your record if you just watch, see your need? Come and surrender. You are worthy. Come to verse 5. The one who overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name. That's judgment now. Out of his book, but watch, friends, confess his name. Before my father, before the angels. Judgment, friends. The Bible says, watch and keep your garments. Keep what, friends? You can keep it if you don't have it. Because Adam and Eve lost it when they sinned. So who has it? Jesus. And what does he say to lukewarm Laodiceans of Revelation 3 verse 18? Come and buy. Buy what? Buy what? Buy the white raiment to cover your nakedness. Friends, today I'm making the transaction. Today I'm buying it. What will you do today, friends? Will you make the transaction? Will you surrender so he can cover you? If so, friends, kneel with me right now. Let's make that transaction. Let's buy that white raiment now, friends. Let's buy it. Let's buy it. Sardis, Laodicea, let's buy it.